Dissolving a solute in a solvent is an equilibrium process similar to evaporation. So you put a chunk of sodium chloride in water, and what happens? Well, the first thing that happens is the ions start to dissolve. Initially, that rate of dissolving is, is higher than the rate of recrystallization because there's nothing out there to recrystallize yet. As the concentration of the dissolved solute increases, then we start to have some of it recrystallizing into a solid. Eventually, we'll get to a point of dynamic equilibrium where the rate of dissolution and the rate of recrystallization are equal. So we have sodium chloride dissolving to form sodium ions and chloride ions, and then we also have sodium and chloride ions recrystallizing to form solid sodium chloride. And here's an illustration of that. Here we have our lump of sodium chloride. There's no sodium ions or chloride ions out here. So initially, all we have is dissolving. As it goes on and we get more and more sodium chloride ions in the solution, then we have some recrystallization occurring. As the concentration is even higher, the rate of recrystallization and the rate of dissolution become equal, and we have a dynamic equilibrium. Does that make sense? We tend to think of it only as dissolving and then just stopping, right? But it's actually dissolving and recrystallizing. So we have some qualitative terms referring to solutions, saturated and unsaturated. A saturated solution is one in which the dissolved solute is in dynamic equilibrium with the solid solute. So if you look at this, there's solid solute sitting on the bottom. It's saturated. It has dissolved as much as will dissolve. The, the solute concentration is at its maximum. If we add more solute to this solution, it will not dissolve. The solution is full, basically. It's saturated. An unsaturated solution contains less than the equilibrium amount. If we add more solute, it will dissolve. And then we have supersaturated solution, which contains more than the equilibrium amount of solute. Now that seems impossible, doesn't it? Supersaturated solutions are unstable, and the excess solute will usually precipitate out. The supersaturated solution is generally made by creating um, a saturated solution at a high temperature and allowing it to slowly cool down. And it's almost like you're tricking the solution. It doesn't realize that it's got too much dissolved. It's a little bit like, you know, Bugs, well, Bugs Bunny didn't do that so much. A wily Coyote would run off the cliff, right? And he wouldn't fall until he noticed that there was nothing under his feet. And then he would fall. That's what a, a supersaturated solution is like. So I've got a couple of videos to show you here. Hopefully this will work. So this is a supersaturated solution of sodium acetate. And when it's disturbed by sticking that stirring rod in, we see that it begins to crystallize. Isn't that neat? So all that is sodium acetate crystallizing out of solution. Here's another one. This is uh, people playing with supersaturated sodium acetate, sticking toothpicks into it and grow snowballs. 52 degrees, so it's an exothermic process. It gives off energy.
it'll crystallize basically solid. It really is just fun. So it's kind of slushy like a popsicle, but it's a solid. And then you can build castles. As the supersaturated solution hits the pie dish, it uh, precipitates and forms a solid. And the precipitation can actually just travel up into the beaker itself. So a little bit like what you did with the supercooled sodium thiosulfate, where you disturbed it by putting in a crystal and then it froze, right? So there they spell the word ice. Um, the solvent is still there, actually. It's just that. Um, there is so little of it that you can't really see it anymore. Let's see, I need to get back to, there we go. Hmm. So that solves all sodium acetate. Yeah, sodium acetate, um, and, and we'll look at the temperature dependence of solubility in a minute. Um, so sodium acetate is actually very soluble in water at a higher temperature. So you heat it up and it will dissolve. Um, you can actually, when you make a solution like this, you take sodium acetate and you basically just put in enough water to cover the crystals. And then you heat it up and it will all dissolve. And so all the water is still here, but it's dispersed within all those crystals. So it looks like a, a liquid became a solid, but it actually is just, it's, the liquid is still there, the water is still there. But I think the videos are a lot more fun than the still pictures. So here's uh, temperature dependence. Most solids are more soluble at higher temperatures. Um, sodium acetate, Sodium acetate's not on here. That's disappointing. Um, so if we look at something like potassium nitrate, at zero degrees Celsius, well, let's look at 10. At 10 degrees Celsius, you can dissolve 20 grams of potassium nitrate in 100 grams of water. If you increase the temperature to 40 degrees, now you can dissolve over 60 grams in, in that same amount of water. Not all solutes will allow you to make a supersaturated solution. But you can see that if, if we made a saturated solution at 40 degrees with over 60 grams of solute in it, and then we cooled it to 10 degrees, we have 40 grams that should not be able to be in solution. And if you disturb that by putting in um, an extra crystal or scratching the beaker or sometimes even just bumping at it or thinking thoughts at it seems to do it sometimes it will just spontaneously crystallize out and the temperature dependence is different for all these different compounds some of them are linear like sodium nitrate some of them are very curved like calcium chloride sodium chloride is actually fairly flat the, the solubility of sodium chloride does not depend very strongly on temperature. And there are some things like sodium sulfate where as you increase the temperature, the solubility decreases. That's the exception rather than the rule, but it does happen. One technique for purifying a solid is called recrystallization. And what happens here is you make a saturated solution at an elevated temperature and allow it to cool slowly. The goal here is not to create a supersaturated solution. As you let it cool slowly, the solid 
will slowly form crystals and the crystalline structure tends to reject impurities when those crystals can form slowly. They're going to exclude any impurities that might be present in the solvent and so you can make your, your solid more pure this way. Um, rock candy is made by recrystallizing table sugar. When you allow it to crystallize slowly, you get much larger crystals of sugar than the original sugar that you put in. And rock candy is, is a fun, making rock candy is a fun, fun thing you can try at home. Yeah. The silver nitrate, yeah, when we made the silver chloride, yeah, we used silver nitrate to make silver chloride. Yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of instances where if you want um, a pure precipitate, you want it to form slowly rather than quickly. You also get larger pieces which filter better. Solutions of gases in water are common. We don't really think about them that much, but they are actually pretty common. Soda is a solution of carbon dioxide in water. Um, most water has dissolved gases in it. <coughs> um, we looked at the solubility of solids in water and we saw that they often increased in solubility with increasing temperature. The solubility of gases decreases with increasing temperature. Um, we could look at warm soda versus cold soda. When you pour warm soda, I'm sorry, that's the cold soda. When you pour cold soda out of a two liter bottle, you get some fizzing, which is the carbon dioxide coming out. But when you pour the same type of soda, <coughs> that's at room temperature, the fizzing is much greater because the solubility of carbon dioxide in warm soda is less. If you have two, two cups of soda on the counter, one's cold, one's warm, the warm one will go flat, lose its fizz much faster than the cold one. And that's because of the, the solubility difference in the warm versus cold. This has implications for aquatic life. Oxygen levels are lower in warm lakes and rivers. So fish, plants need, well, I guess the plants don't need oxygen. It's the fish and the turtles and then the other things down there. They need oxygen in the water. Uh, when we first moved to the Central Valley, we got some goldfish at a carnival. And so we put them in a bowl of water. And it was in the summer. And so the house was warm. And these poor goldfish are just like gasping for air in the water, right? Because the water temperature was too high for them. The solubility of oxygen in the water is lower. And so it's like going to a very high altitude. For us, they're just gasping for oxygen. The solution to that is to cool down the aquarium. It's like, okay, I am not going to keep my house at 72 all summer just for this stupid fish that cost me a dollar, right? Um, so, you know, we'd put ice cubes in the water periodically. Eventually, they acclimated, and they did not die due to my neglect, so no goldfish were harmed. But this is important in terms of um, thermal pollution. If you have some sort of a processing plant that is dumping warm water into a river, the water may be clean. It may be pure water. It's not pollution of chemicals, but it's pollution of heat because that raises the temperature of the river and starves the things living in it of oxygen. Pressure also has an effect on the solubility of gases. The solubility of the gas will increase with the pressure of the gas above the liquid. So soda cans are pressurized. Um, a can of soda is never full all the way to the top. A bottle of soda, never full all the way to the top with soda. And there's a reason for that, and not that the manufacturer is being stingy. You need a little bit of space up there to have a high pressure of carbon dioxide. The pressure of carbon dioxide in that little head space keeps the carbon dioxide dissolved in the soda. 
When you open the can and you hear that nice little sound, that's the pressure of the CO2 escaping. Now that that pressure is gone, the carbon dioxide that's dissolved in the water will start to come out. You can, you can actually observe this in a clear bottle, like a two liter bottle of soda. You open the lid and you see bubbles starting to come out, right? That's because you've reduced the pressure of CO2 above the liquid and you've reduced the solubility and it's, it's on its way to going flat. We can think of this in terms of equilibrium. So here we have a container, we've got carbon dioxide um, up here and we've got some carbon dioxide dissolved in the water. So we have carbon dioxide escaping from the water and we have carbon dioxide getting trapped in the water. This is at equilibrium. When we increase the pressure, here we're increasing the pressure by decreasing the volume of that headspace, the concentration of carbon dioxide now in the gas state is higher. The pressure is higher. There's more particles per, per unit volume. That increases the rate of the carbon dioxide dissolving in the water. The rate of the carbon dioxide leaving the water, it remains relatively constant. And so this increased dissolving will continue until the rates of dissolving and escaping are equal again and an equilibrium is established. Any questions? Sometimes you see people selling on television these little gizmos for the top of your soda bottle that is supposed to help your soda stay fizzy longer. And basically you're pumping air into the bottle. Is that really going to help keep the carbon dioxide dissolved in your soda? How much carbon dioxide is in the air? A little bit. I think it's like 0.6% or something. It's a small component of air. Increasing the air pressure above your soda only increases the carbon dioxide pressure a teeny tiny bit. It's not going to have a significant effect on increasing the solubility of carbon dioxide in your soda. Now, if you pump CO2 in there, yeah, you can do that. You can recarbonate soda by putting a high pressure of carbon dioxide over your flat soda. Uh, it's just usually not worth the effort, though. Um, Henry's law quantifies the relationship between gas solubility and the partial pressure of the particular gas. It's the partial pressure, the pressure of the individual gas, that increases the solubility. The pressure of the other gases doesn't matter. Um, here's a table from your textbook of Henry's law constants. I want you to note that there's an error for helium. The, the constant for helium is 3.7 times 10 to the minus 4, not plus 4. Um, that's, that's an issue. <laughs> Oops. So here's Henry's law. The, the solubility of a gas is equal to Henry's law constant times the partial pressure of that particular gas. So gas solubility is usually expressed in moles per liter. The Henry's law constant you would look up. It's going to depend on the individual gas, the solvent, and the temperature. And so here we have, these are for several different gases, and it specifies that the solvent is water and the temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. So these different gases are going to have different constants. You just look these up. The unit on this, in this table, is molarity per atmosphere, moles per liter atmosphere. And then the partial pressure, it's the partial pressure of the individual gas, and that's usually in atmospheres. So we can do a problem like this. Determine the solubility of oxygen and water at 25 degrees Celsius exposed to air at one atmosphere. Assume a partial pressure of oxygen of 0.21 atmospheres. Well, we need more information. We need the Henry's Law constant for oxygen. So for oxygen, KH is 1.3 times 10 to the minus 3 molarity per atmosphere. 1.3 times 10 to the minus 3. 1.3 times 10 to the minus 3. 
k and h 1.3 times 10 to the minus 3 molarity per atmosphere. Henry's law says that the solubility of oxygen is going to equal kh for the oxygen times the partial pressure of oxygen. Well, here's the partial pressure right there. So we've got KH um, minus 3, and that's molarity per atmosphere, times 0 0.21 atmospheres. We see that the atmospheres cancel out, and we get a unit of um, molarity. I <laughs> just really... I forgot to turn the lights back on. <laughs> Sorry about that. <sighs> I don't want to give you guys any more excuses for falling asleep on me. 1.3 times to the minus third um, times 0.21. 2.73 times 10 to the minus 4. And this should have two sig figs. 2.7 times 10 to the minus 4 moles per liter. Any questions? The higher the partial pressure, the higher the solubility.